last year, I spent 37 years in the courtroom trying cases all the way from civil contract disputes to murders. And I spent the last 20 years of my career here in Montana. I grew up uh, in the military, but basically had home on the East Coast until the muse got in my ear and I wandered to uh, Spokane to go to law school in Spokane. And after that, I went to Hawaii, I mean to Alaska, where I spent uh, about uh, 12 years practicing law in Alaska, traveling all around that great big gorgeous state. It's the little brother of Montana, believe me, there are so many similarities in the two. When I got tired of the darkness, I got admitted to practice in Hawaii, and I went and practiced and lived in Hawaii on the Big Island for four years. And finally, in a fit of something, I fell on my head and went to Memphis and practiced criminal law in Memphis for about a year and a half in the urban jungles of Memphis. And it was a wonderful experience and a lot of great stories. Uh, but I wound up here in Montana. What an amazing place. And I put that map up there just because I guess it struck me after coming here from Alaska, it seemed that everything was on a small scale and it wasn't until I was actually here traveling around both on work and pleasure that I realized what a gorgeous, huge, amazing, diverse, disparate place uh, Montana is. And so I just like to stare at that from time to time to see all the different places and they all have personalities and they all have stories. And that was part of what was behind this project. I wound up in Great Falls when I first came to Montana through a series of events that are unimportant to this story. And for 12, 13 years in Montana, I ran the public defender office and I got uh, immersed in the full impact of the criminal law, uh, handling a lot of different cases, supervising and uh, meeting judges, traveling to outlying counties, doing casework and so forth. And this is important because it led ultimately to uh, the project that I'm here tonight to talk about. Some of you might recognize that. That is the courtroom in what I consider to be, I won't say the, but I'll put it in the category of one of the top two or three most beautiful courthouses in Montana. That's the courthouse in Boulder in Jefferson County. And what an amazing, beautiful courthouse and what a job they have done preserving functionality or, or ensuring functionality and preserving the historical aura of the building itself. Um, so the name of my book is Courting Truth. And one of the questions that comes up is, well, what exactly does that mean? And in order to get to the bottom of what will ultimately prove to be my cynicism as well as my excitement, we have to understand what's the purpose of a trial because I just told you I spent 37 years in a courtroom doing trials. And if you go to law school or if you've ever had the privilege or the inconvenience of sitting on a jury, what you know is what you're told, that the purpose of a trial is that it's a search for the truth. I can hardly say the word truth anymore with a straight face, but it is what society says is the function of a trial. Search for the truth. Find out what really happened because that, after all, is the truth. Well, you know the old story about, the old joke about what do you get when you put two lawyers together in a courtroom? You get a dozen versions of the truth. <laughs> and that's basically Aesop, who wrote the fables, pointed out that every truth has two sides. I'd say at least two sides. One of the mechanisms that we use in the trial work is we say, this is my hand. You recognize this is my hand. If you study this, you will learn that this is my hand, and pretty soon you will be absolutely familiar with what my hand looks like. But this is also my hand, as is this. There are many versions of the truth. That's an upside-down view of the world, isn't it? You can see, however, that Australia, at the top, is written so we can read it. And the United States is on top of Canada so we can read it. But as we sit in this room, we say that's an upside-down view of the world. That's not a true view of the world. And I say it's not about truth, it's about your perception. Because if you're in Australia, in fact, this is a version of the truth. If you look at the world as emanating outward from where you are. This is a very important principle that I tried to use during the years I was working at the Public Defender Office uh, after we started the statewide system to teach young lawyers that if you're going to function in a courtroom, you have to understand that if you're looking for the truth, you're not going to have a very nice time. What you're looking for is what people perceived about what happened. And from that, you shape the truth, you carve the truth. 
I will say to you that the truth is that that's a young woman looking back over her right shoulder with a plume in the front of her head and a headdress on. That's the truth of that picture. Anybody see something different? Everyone see the, the young woman there? There's her nose. You can't see her eye. She's looking away. But isn't it also true that that's an old woman? There's her mouth. There's her nose. So what's true? Is that a picture of an old woman or a picture of a young woman? And once you digest that, how many truths can you find in this picture? I would suggest to you there are at least three truths in this picture. There's the young woman with her nose and her chin. There's the old woman with her chin and her nose. And then there's a fellow here with a mustache wearing a Scottish hat. Truth is a shapeshifter. And so in the front of my book, I included a proverb that when you understand it, helps you really realize that as a historian, which all of you are, what version of the truth you're getting, what version of history you're getting, depends on who's telling you the story. And if you're hearing the story from the hunters, the story is going to elevate the hunter and downgrade the prey. But if you're hearing the story from the prey, you're going to get a different point of view. Now, as historians, we're interested in distinguishing truth and legend. And legend, as the dictionary tells us, is not necessarily untrue. It is just primarily unverifiable. Being able to extract history from the, myth of, from the mist of legends is the challenge of historians, and it's the challenge of civilization as it moves forward and tries to preserve its past. I would say that I learned a long time ago you can't give a presentation without having an Oscar Wilde quote. So there's my Oscar Wilde quote for the day. And it goes to the heart of what I'm talking about. Legends are every bit as important as the accurate truth of what's said. Um, legends is part of what helps build a culture just as much as what people profess to be the truth. Now, as a fun little uh, insertion here, I uh, have a series of questions interspersed throughout my presentation here, and I'm moving quickly so we can get through it. Historical trivia, which, if you compound the word, is otherwise called histrivia. So when you see a histrivia question, you know that you're dealing with trivia from history in one form or another. And here's the first one. And I'm sure all of you here know a lot more about this stuff than I do because my mission in this book is to tell stories. Franklin Roosevelt said that good stories are always preferable to accurate stories. <laughs> and so I'm beginning with what I know to be accurate, which comes out of the court files, and I'm telling the stories from there. Because I have had the opportunity in my lifetime to stand next to somebody in court that I knew was innocent who got convicted by the jury. And I've had probably many more times the opportunity to stand with people that I know are guilty who were found to be innocent or less guilty. And how that adds up is what we're all struggling with. The name is Everton J. Conger. Some of you may recognize that name. He presided over the China Tong War murder case, which again, you probably have had presentations on, and I'll mention it here briefly. It's the case I start the book with. With which famous person outside Montana was Judge Conger's life closely intertwined? I'm not going to read them out loud. I'll simply put them up there, let you study it for a minute, and see if you can connect Everton J. Conger up with any of those individuals. And the answer is John Wilkes Booth. Everton Conger was a judge in Montana who presided over the Chinatown War murder trial, which we'll get to in a minute. But Everton Conger was also in charge of the uh, military force that was chasing John Wilkes Booth. And it was Everton Conger who knelt at John Wilkes Booth's side outside the burning barn at Garrett's Farm in 1865 after Booth assassinated Lincoln. And it's Conger who heard Booth breathe his last words, tell my mother I die for my country. Again, what's fascinated me once I finished my day job and started turning to the fun of writing is all the amazing connections that I find in Montana for things that happened outside Montana 
that many of us never knew about. On the back of my book, one of my friends who's a clerk of court up in Haver, who's now my friend, she wasn't when I started working on the book, points out that these are stories that even people in the local community, small towns, may have forgotten some of the stories that are in the book. So the chapter one of the book, I'm not going through every chapter, and I'm not even going to tell the story, but chapter one, which is called Yellow Peril, deals with the legendary Chinese Tong War murder case. There was a great article in the Montana Magazine a couple of years ago by Dr. Laura Arada called uh, Moving Beyond the Mongolian Muddle or something like that, in which she attempts to pinpoint historical accuracy in the middle of the mist of legend that has grown up around this case. There's the Supreme Court citation to the case of Territory of Montana versus Awa and Ayin, the two Chinese laborers, who were arrested for murder in the wake of a one-day, all-out, din-and-dust rumble in the Alder Gulch Valley in 1881, in which at least one person was killed and allegedly decapitated. Here's another Historivia question. One of, two, one of Montana's courtroom legends, a lawyer, used to post bail for defendants in this county as a means of indenturing them to work for him on one of his many ranches. Not bad. He'd go to the jail, he'd post their bond, that indentured them to him, and he'd represent them at trial. Meanwhile, they hauled him back to his ranch. Was it Mar County, Yellowstone County, Glacier, or Sheridan? The answer is Mar County. Mar County. And it was Wellington Rankin, former attorney general and trial lawyer extraordinaire, who was also, at one point in time, the largest ranch owner in Montana. Most of his property was located in uh, Mark County. Speaking of Mark County, the idea for this book occurred to me one afternoon a number of summers ago when I was driving across US 12 on my way to a legal function in uh, Billings. In the middle of, I won't say out in the middle of nowhere, because no one from White Sulphur Springs would appreciate being described that way, but as with so many of these distant Montana communities, they are certainly a long way from everybody else. And as I drove through I, uh, US 12 across Montana and passed through White Sulphur Springs, I saw the courthouse and I thought, I'm going to stop here. Here's a courthouse. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that the people that live in this part of the state don't appreciate having to pay taxes or government or whatever. And so why in the world did they ever appreciate having a courthouse built with tax money, which they had to contribute to? There must be something going on that justified the building of a courthouse, particularly one as uh, solid as that, which was built in, the, I believe, the early 50s. Uh, so I went inside, and I walked upstairs, and I sat down in the courtroom. And as is the case in so many of these small town courthouses and courtrooms, there wasn't much going on in that particular day, and the courtroom was empty. They've since added that picture over there, which, I don't know, maybe belongs in the courtroom. Again. <laughs> uh, but here's a shot of the uh, court, courtroom. And as I sat there, I thought to myself, I wonder Certainly something's gone on in this courtroom in the 50, some 60 years since they built it, and yet what has happened? What, whatever happened? And from that sprang the idea of writing a book to try to find out some of the stories so that people would appreciate what courtrooms and courthouses are all about. And so there's a map of Montana that in gray highlights the counties that are discussed in this book um, as I decided to sort of sprinkle around the state and go here and there and all over it. So I got a cross-section of all the different places. And now, as I'll say at the end, at work on my second book, I just finished the whole summer traveling around to 14 more counties. There are 56 counties in Montana, which divided by four makes 14. And so 14 fits nicely in a, in a book. And so if I can keep my concentration up long enough, there may be four of these. Uh, here's a third question. Henry Plummer, we all know who he was, of the Montana Vigilantes, went on trial for murder and robbery in the Madison County Courthouse in Virginia City in what year? Well, you know who he was and you know about the time he was, so you probably say, all right, I think I know that. And the answer is he did not go on trial in 1863. That's the year in which he was lynched. He was hanged by the Vigilantes. In fact, he went on trial in 1993 when a high school class from Twin Bridges staged a mock trial in the courthouse in Virginia City in costume 
And uh, that's a great piece of Montana history. And the jury, not to give away the story, but the jury ultimately concluded they hung. And so he got hung, but they hung. And so who knows what would have happened if Henry would have ever got a decent trial. Vigilante justice. As you'll see at the end, I have an associate, Hector, who mocked up some photographs for us throughout the book that are based on pieces and parts using the magnificent tool of Photoshop. So uh, vigilante justice. Chapter two deals with what I call the Grand Dame, which is the Virginia City Courthouse in Madison County. It is the oldest continuously functioning courthouse in Montana, christened July 4th, 1876, a mere 10 days after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. If you're history, history buff like I am, you kind of get a little bit of chills thinking about the party going on for the inauguration and the christening of this courthouse and the blood and smoke still hanging in the air from the Little Bighorn Battlefield, only a couple hundred miles away. Certainly by then the word had reached them of what had gone on. And there's the courtroom in the Madison County Courthouse in Virginia City and hanging on the wall above the jury box, and after all it is from the jury that justice is dispensed in, in, in uh, disputed cases, hangs the picture of Bill Fairweather, who we all know uh, started the gold rush in Alder Gulch, in, uh, functionally in Montana, and it was Bill Fair Fairweather who died penniless and drunk, uh, despite the great fame and fortune that he achieved coming to the Alder Gulch. I thought it was appropriate that he would be the ultimate dispenser of justice, supervisor of justice, in the uh, Virginia City courtroom. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon, we know how that works. Everybody's related to, some, to Ke everybody can make a personal connection with six moves to get back to the act of Kevin Bacon. Don't ask me where that came from, but it's been around for years. So here's an exercise in Francis Scott Key. And I'll give you the four Montanans, one of whom is closely connected to Francis Scott Key. And Lenore's chuckling because she knows the answer. Here's how it works. Francis Scott Key, who we all know, wrote the national anthem, had a son named Philip Barton Key, who was the district attorney for Washington, D.C., and who had an affair with a woman named Teresa Sickles, who was married to Daniel Edgar Sickles, the year is 1854, who happened to be a U.S. congressman, and who, when he found out about the affair, took a pistol and shot Mr. Key, Barton Key, in the middle of Lafayette Square across the street from the White House in D.C. Outrage, outrage, high profile, U.S. congressman. Mr. Sickle then went to his friend, President James Buchanan, across the street, and they put together a team of attorneys to defend Mr. Sickles on the charge of murder, which was inevitably prosecuted against him. Uh, leading the team was uh, William Stanton, who went on to become Secretary of War under Abraham Lincoln. Also, an amazing trial lawyer named James Topham Brady, who was the courtroom genius in the team, and an enterprising, fascinating former Irishman named Thomas Francis Marr, oh, no, no. who by himself is worth books and books and books and movies. An ama more amazing life you can hardly think of. Born in Ireland, instituting rebellion in Ireland, condemned to die, uh, banished to the Australian prison in Tasmania off the coast of Australia, escapes from there, comes to America, uh, becomes a lawyer, winds up representing Daniel Sickles, um, and goes on to become governor of Montana, and who then tragically, mysteriously, uh, dies falling off the deck of a riverboat uh, in Fort Benton, which will be part of the next book that I write. Um, uh, two things about, uh, two additional things about this Francis Scott Key, Francis, or Philip Barton Key, Sickles uh, Marr connection, the most important of which is uh, this is the first uh, case in American history of the successful use of the defense of temporary insanity. And you must read about this case, it's fascinating. It was the trial of the century, it was the O.J. Simpson of, 18, of the 1850s. Every couple of years we have the trial of the century, but, but this was the trial of the century in Washington, <laughs> D.C. and in America in the 1850s. And they implemented a defense of temporary insanity and he beat the rap 
and it was due in no small part to the oratorical skills of Thomas Francis Marr and the others on the team. So there he is, General Marr. Many of you maybe, like I, spent years going in and out of the Capitol, running up and down the stairs on the north side, on the hillside there, going past the inconvenient statue that was right in the middle of a straight walkway out to the street, not paying attention except knowing that there was some guy in a hat with a sword sitting on a horse. One day, as I was scurrying out the same pathway, with my back to the statute, as I traveled down the sidewalk, a voice said to me, I recognize you, sir. And I turned around, and it was General Marr. <laughs> and General Marr and I had a wonderful time debating his exploits with the sword and helping to promote my exploits with the pen and then decide which of us would have more impact in the long run. As a result of my conversations with General Marr, he sent me to the uh, lobby of the Bank of the Rockies in White Sulphur Springs, Marr County, where my idea had originally begun. And there hanging on the wall is a portrait of General Marr that was given to the Montana Historical Society by his widow and was subsequently donated to, uh, or contributed to hang on the wall of the Bank of the Rockies in White Sulphur Springs in honor of the county which bears his name. As it hung on the wall, he talked to me and told me the stories from Marr County Courthouse, which he looks over as time passes. And that, as you saw, was chapter 10, channeling the general. Here's another question. The largest punitive damage award in Montana District Court history comes from a 2005 jury trial involving the work of one of these famous Montanans. Pick one. C.M. Russell, Ivan Doig, Monty Dolak, or Gary Cooper. It's a punitive damage award. Punitive damages are awarded not just for the damage that you suffered, but as punishment for having imposed the damages on you, and they can become exorbitant. In this case, they were, from the jury, $20 million, reduced by the judge to just under $10 million, but nevertheless substantial. And on appeal to the Supreme Court, the damage award held, the punitive damage award. The answer is, there's the picture. And that is a C.M. Russell picture, isn't it? It's called lassoing a longhorn, except guess what? It's not a Russell. It was painted by O.C. Seltzer, some of whose paintings are hanging behind us tonight. There's the case citation. It comes out of Great Falls, Cascade County. It's a marvelous story about somebody who bought a painting under the impression that it was painted by X and found out many years later as he tried to sell it that it wasn't painted by X, it was painted by Y. And he didn't take to it very well and he had friends who were very powerful lawyers from out of state and they decided to try to flex their muscle in the hometown courtroom of Steve Seltzer who is the grandson of O.C. Seltzer. And uh, that's one of the stories that's told, at least a piece of it, it's told in the chapter uh, six, Lady Justice. When I went back to Great Falls, where I had spent many years in, trying cases in both the red courtroom, we call that the red courtroom because of the red carpet, and across the hall, the other big courtroom, the blue courtroom, and I climbed to the top of the dome one afternoon with my friend Stan, who's the maintenance man, to have a long conversation with Lady Justice who, though she was tired, told us a lot of stories, some of which I had participated in and knew about and others of which I was not familiar. Here's another one. That name ought to be pretty evident. Duncan McKenzie. Right? Duncan McKenzie is a capital murderer from Conrad. He's in the book because he spent more time on death row at the time in Montana than any other person in the United States before he was finally executed for killing Lana Harding in Conrad in the early 70s. But the answer, the answer to the question is a judge from Dillon because, again, in one of those interesting twists of discovery that you uncover when you begin to do legal or historical research, there's a physician in the early part of the 20th century in Haver by the name of Duncan McKenzie 
who was involved in doing a number of forensic examinations in homicide cases, and who's involved in a couple of very famous cases, some of which are discussed in the book. And Duncan McKenzie is also the name of the stonemason who did the stonework for the Great Falls Cascade County Courthouse, which was built in 1902. My friend Ken Neal, who's a district judge in Great Falls, and has been a great supporter not only of me, but of the research that he and I have both been doing, and who wrote his own little pamphlet about the history of the Cascade County Courthouse, was stunned to learn when I called him up one day, and caught him in chambers, and I said, hey, have you got your pamphlet there? Open it up to page two, and look at the bottom at the name of the guy who did the stonework, and anybody who's been involved in criminal practice in Montana within the last 15 to 20 years at least, and going back further, knows immediately the name of Duncan McKenzie, horrible capital murderer. He was dumbstruck to learn that there was a Duncan McKenzie, no relation obviously, who had helped build the Cascade County Courthouse in 1902. Great Falls was very familiar to me, but there were places I went where I didn't know anybody. And one of them was Ekalaka, out in the far southeast corner. Some wonderful stories, as there are everywhere, from Ekalaka. The picture on the left is what the courthouse looked like when I got there in the summer, the early summer of, or late spring of 2012. Beautiful trees, shading the walkway, a canopy of vines um, to the beautiful old courthouse built back in the uh, first decade of the 20th century. The picture on the right is what it looks like now, because in the name of progress and renovation, they added on the entire section to the right of the flagpole there. Uh, and in so doing, they ripped out all the trees. And as one of the people in the county told me when I was there, I'd hate to be a commissioner when they find out what's happening to the trees. And I, I don't know what happened to the commissioner, but I asked where they got the money, and she said the commission went and got it. So there are great stories everywhere in Montana. Chapter 7 talks about the courthouse on the edge of forever, which is from a Star Trek episode, and that's why the Enterprise is up there in the corner. And chapter 14 talks about Sherwood Forest, that's Mineral County, a little band of forest that runs up the interstate along the mountain ridge, uh, heading toward Montana, heading over toward the Idaho border on I-90. And chapter 15, the last chapter in the book, delves into the notion of Indian country and that takes place down in Hardin and Bighorn County. Here's another question. The only district judge in Montana history to ever be impeached and removed from office by the Montana legislature presided in which of these counties? Again, you've probably had a presentation about him. Well, I ha when I started this project, someone told me, hey, you know, there was a judge, a district judge once, only one, who got impeached by the Montana State Legislature. And I said, ooh, I gotta write that story. Who was that? And they said, I don't know. <laughs> I only knew one word when I started up. There he is, by the way, it's Judge Charles Crum. That's how I learned about him in my fanciful world. He's sitting in the courtroom. Rosebud. I should say, Rosebud. And there's the Rosebud County Courthouse, opened in 1913. Now, I think that where I am here, I want to get ahead of myself, is, uh, yep, we're closing in on there. All righty, so, uh, Did you know that in the Rosebud County Courthouse in Forsyth, in the district court courtroom, which is well preserved, as it has been for many decades, there is a bullet hole. You can see it there in the picture. In the judge's bench, behind the judge's bench, in the main courtroom, a bullet hole. A bullet hole in a courtroom. What is that doing there? Well, if you'll indulge me a minute, I have two people here that would like to tell you the story of how the bullet hole got in the courtroom. Hello. My name is Henry Grierson. I was sheriff of Rosebud County, Montana back in the day. 
Here with me today is Alfred Lane, a most unfortunate soul whose fate it was, I'm afraid, to surrender his life to me at the end of a hangman's noose. Mr. Lane and I want to tell you the story of how he killed young Harry Theed, of the price he ultimately paid, and of a rather humorous event that transpired during his trial, an event evidence of which is still present in the main courtroom of the Rosebud County Courthouse to this very day. Now, Harry Theed was a well-liked young man, well-mannered, and very eager to help anyone whose path he happened to cross. It was a true shame when I found his body lying on the floor of Mr. Lane's cabin on a chilly April morning back in 1920. <coughs> easy there, Alfred, my man. In your condition, talking's not an easy act. Just relax and take it slowly. We're in no sort of a hurry here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Alfred took a shotgun and blew poor Mr. Theed away. No one on the jury had any particular problem with finding him guilty. Before sentencing him to hang, Judge Jones made sure everyone in the courtroom was in agreement with the decision. Well, not everyone in the room was in agreement. I don't really think I deserve to hang. I mean, I liked Harry as much as anyone. I never really meant to kill him, you know. That's what trials are for, my friend. You and your lawyer had your chances to make a pitch for another outcome when you went to trial. What well, wasn't much of a trial. Seems like all anyone wanted to do was get on with the necktie party. Well, like I said, Harry had a lot of friends. You should have thought about that before you passed him all those bad checks that he used to buy things in Miles City. I wasn't trying to hurt the kid. I would have made good on all of them, eventually. And you know what? Harry probably would have let you. All he wanted was for you to help him clear his name with the merchants in Miles City who took the checks from him in good faith. Maybe. But when he showed up at your place that day, you never even gave him a chance. You just pulled out your shotgun and plastered him. It, it, it was like I told the jury. I didn't mean to kill him. I just panicked. He was plenty upset, and I didn't know what he might do. He might have shot me first. Now, there you go again, Alfred. I thought you would have realized by now that no one who ever heard you talk about being afraid of Harry believed a word you said. I mean, honestly, the jury only deliberated for 35 minutes. You put three rounds into him, for God's sake. Hardly evidence of self-defense. <clears throat> and you didn't help yourself by hiding Harry's body underneath the trap door in the floor of your cabin and then taken off and running away. I wasn't running. I, I needed to figure, I needed time. I, I just needed to figure things out. Is that why you broke into the dry goods store in Forsyth the next day and stole a bunch of food and ammunition because you needed time to think? Shoot, I left a note for the store owner apologizing for breaking the window. Yes, you did. But exactly what was that supposed to be? Some kind of favorable character evidence or something in case you got caught? It, it was proof that I didn't want to have to do what I did. I only did it because you were chasing after me and were going to hang me if you caught me. That's exactly what I mean, Alfred. That was part of your downfall. You just never saw the facts the same way the rest of us did. Still don't, it seems. Jesus, what else could I have done to make you understand how sorry I was? I mean, I turned myself into your posse voluntarily, didn't I? <laughs> a 
What else could you have done, Alfred? You were out of food, out of ammunition, and a posse of determined deputies was on hand, hard on your trail. It was only a matter of time before we would have found you. Well, I... I the only thing that counted was what you did to poor Harry. It's kind of stupid to kill someone with a shotgun and expect a whole lot of sympathy at trial. Maybe, but it didn't help that you and the prosecutor arranged for the shotgun to fire off in the middle of the trial. Now wait just a minute. We didn't do that on purpose. We caught hell from Judge Jones for that. Sure, sure, you want me to believe it was just an accident that you handed the murder weapon to the judge and it was loaded. That it was merely coincidental when the judge held it up to inspect it that it discharged. That's exactly what it was, an accident. I would be out of my mind to hand a loaded firearm to a judge in the middle of a trial. I almost got held in contempt as it was. Thank God no one was in the line of fire when it went off. It left a good-sized hole in the wall right behind the judge's seat. Anyone who walks into the Rosebud County Courthouse can walk over to the judge's bench and see it, even now. I swear to you, we had it all checked out before we handed it to the judge. It was empty. Well, it wasn't empty when he took it. When that goddamn thing went off, it sounded like a bomb had exploded in the courtroom. Ugh, it scared the hell out of every man on the jury. Huh, scared the bejesus out of me too, I have to admit. That's my point. You guys were trying like hell in that trial to convince them what a dangerous guy I was. If they weren't buying it beforehand, I'm sure there wasn't a whole lot of argument on that point after the blast from the shotgun woke them up. Our time's almost up, old salt. All that's left of the story is to recall the hanging. None of you sons of bitches even bothered to file an appeal for me. It wasn't necessary, Alfred. From the time you pointed that shotgun at Harry and pulled the trigger, you had an appointment with the gallows. All that was left was to figure out where and when. The morning of September 3rd, 1920. The eastern horizon was beginning to lighten. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. The morning star beamed down onto the prairie like a far-off beacon, beckoning me homeward. As strange as it sounds, I think it was the most peaceful moment of my life. Now, in the story, they talk about the coincidence of the gun being discharged. I can tell you after 35 plus years handling cases in the courtroom, I don't believe in coincidence. So you can draw your own conclusions about what advantage was gained or not at having a shotgun go off during the trial of someone accu accused of murder who was supposedly such a bad character. Here's another question. Interesting little tidbit that I picked up from interviews. The cremated remains of one of Montana's most zealous trial lawyers are rumored to have been scattered beneath the jury box. What a fitting place to go, huh? <laughs> In which of these counties? There would be no reason you would know that unless you talked to the source that I talked to. And of course, I wasn't about to go crawling under the jury box. Let's just say I have it on reliable authority, and you can take that as the truth whatever the truth is. That story is contained in chapter four, which is called The Tale of Two Cities, which is about Glacier County, which on one end has the Blackfeet Nation and 80% of the land mass of, of Glacier County, creating some interesting jurisdictional conflicts, not only for the people who live there, but for passengers passing through in cars. And on the other end, on the east end of the county, on a little band of land that runs along the eastern border of the county, is the town of Cutbank, which happens to have in it the world's largest penguin. I thought that was kind of interesting. There's the Glacier County Courthouse, opened in 1938. One of a number of courthouses in Montana that were constructed 
through the good graces of FDR and his Works Project Administration, brought a lot of jobs to a lot of people that otherwise wouldn't have them. That's not a political letter, it's just a statement of fact. So there's a story called Waiting for the Oriental Limited. That's what I call it. It comes from the case that's referenced down uh, in the bottom, and hopefully I'm going to be able to trigger the audio by clicking on that little thing right there. In December of 1925, two local men, Jim Comes by Night and Peter Running Crane, were arrested and charged with felony mischief for attempting to derail the Great Northern Railroad's Oriental Limited Train Number 1. The young men, it seems, were simply looking to have a bit of fun and perhaps make a few dollars for themselves in the mayhem which ensued. Their plan was to loosen a couple of the rails and cut the telegraph lines alongside the track. That way the train crew would be unable to notify company officials until after the boys had made their escape. Fortunately, when Comes by Night and Running Crane cut the line wires, they also broke the circuit for the railroad's warning system, which caused a danger signal to be flashed down the line to the approaching train. The engineer managed to get the train, packed with holiday travelers, stopped before it reached the loosened rails. After the train came to a halt, trainmen spotted two figures on horseback watching the activity from an adjacent rise. The horsemen rode away, but were eventually identified and arrested. The sheriff, R.J. Croft, pointed out that the train was speeding across the prairie at 50 miles per hour and asked the two men why they would want to derail a train full of people when doing so could have resulted in many injuries and deaths. Comes by night replied simply that, we wanted to watch the train tip over and then we planned to go and take the valuable things that would spill out. The two men were found guilty in Glacier County District Court and received sentences of 30 years of hard labor at the Montana State Prison. It's historically significant to point out that Sheriff Croft, a member of the Blackfeet tribe, was the first Native American ever elected as a county sheriff in America. The year was 1924. Isn't that an interesting piece of news? Get this little train story with these kids, young men that are trying to knock the train off the track and watch the mayhem, and the sheriff turns out to be, you just stumble across him, turns out to be the first elected Indian sheriff. That's, uh, I thought that was pretty fun. All right, so here's uh, a question about the Granite County Courthouse. A third party national, I should say, presidential candidate is a regular visitor to the Granite County Courthouse in Phillipsburg. Was it Gus Hall? Some of these names might remember. Ralph Nader, that's their party affiliation. Ross Perot. Merrill Riddick, look at that one, Magneto Hydrodynamics and Prohibition Party, and Teddy Roosevelt. Some of you, I saw some heads nodding, recognize that the third party candidate was Mr. Riddick, who lived in the Phillipsburg area. He was quite a character himself. He uh, flew with Eddie Rickenbacker as one of the flying uh, aces in World War I, and later barnstormed with Lucky Lindy throughout uh, the plains. And, uh, there's some interesting stories about him, some of which are just referenced in Chapter 8, which is called Silver, Sapphires, and the Shaft. Uh, a little side note, when I went to Phillipsburg, uh, I thought that everyone in Phillipsburg, like other some other places in Montana, had money. Because there was all the silver in the mountains there and all the sapphires that they pull out of Ruby Creek and stuff. And my friend who escorted me, who was fictionalized in the chapter as one of, the, one of my escorts, told me that, yeah, a lot of people got silver and a lot of people got sapphires, and all of us left in Phillipsburg got the shaft. So I thought that was an interesting history that educated me about something that I was not aware of in Granite County. That's the Granite County Courthouse. And the story that you're about to hear is maybe my favorite in the book. It's called A Bear Killed Him. supposed to start automatically, but we'll just help it.
The sheriff oh, declared oh, that the evidence a supported a conclusion that the man had died as a result a of having I been mauled back by Hang a bear. Hang on one second. Technology mauled always manages. That's what he said. Here. A see, bear it. did it. Do he that. refused to conduct any further invest. Here we go. Did you ever hear about the time the Missoula Police Department sent the Granite County Sheriff a wanted poster with the picture of a bear on it? A wanted poster for a bear? I never heard that one before. Missoula sent out a wanted poster. Back in 1978. The sheriff back then was kind of a, well, let's just say he was an original. One of a kind. At least I sure hope so. Headstrong and frankly kind of lazy. If law enforcement officials in Missoula and elsewhere sent the Granite County Sheriff a notice, a warrant, or a poster for a crime that supposedly happened in his county, they soon discovered it was a waste of time. People in Phillipsburg used to say that if it was up to him, he wouldn't arrest anybody for anything, which is part of what makes this such a great story. In the early summer of 1978, some campers found a dead body near a campsite on Brewster Creek, not far from Phillipsburg. The body was that of a man, but no one recognized him, and it was decided he was probably a transient. Now at that time, Granite County didn't have a formal arrangement in place with the state crime lab to do post-mortem examinations. As a result, dead bodies were simply examined at the local mortuary in Phillipsburg. The body was therefore sent to the mortician. During his examination, the mortician found a puncture mark in the deceased abdomen. Furthermore, upon examining the metal belt buckle the deceased was wearing at the time, he discovered that it had a hole clear through it. Sounds like a bullet hole to me. Some people thought so, including a couple of officers in the Missoula Police Department who had a chance to review the file and pictures after the exam. So he was shot. Who did it? Not so fast. When the examining mortician presented the Granite County Sheriff with the results of the examination, the sheriff declared that the evidence supported a conclusion that the man had died as a result of having been mauled by a bear. Mauled by a bear? That's what he said. A bear did it. He refused to conduct any further investigations and closed the file. The file remained closed for over a year despite the fact that the police and other counties reviewed the autopsy examination report and tried to get the Granite County Sheriff to reopen an investigation into the homicide. But he wouldn't do it. He just kept saying that the man had been killed by a bear. So where does the wanted poster come into the story? The whole thing got to be a standing joke among some of the folks in law enforcement, especially over in Missoula, which has always looked on Granite County like it's part of Appalachia or something. Some of the cops over there were so frustrated and amused at the sheriff's insistence that a bear had done this killing that they mocked up a Oops. Ah. Did you ever hear about the uh, time the Missoula Police on, Department sent the Granite County Sheriff a Misfire. wanted poster with the picture of a here. bear on it? Appalachia or something. Some of the cops over there were so frustrated and amused at the sheriff's insistence that a bear had done this killing that they mocked up a wanted poster showing a bear standing on its hind legs holding a high-powered rifle. It circulated all over the courthouse and sort of made the sheriff a standing joke. He refused to budge though, huh? Even after the wanted poster made it made its rounds? Just so. He never did change his theory, at least not publicly. So the murder went unsolved? No, it didn't. And when you hear how it turned out, I promise you you're going to smile. It's one of those bizarrely humorous twists of faith that makes you just shake your head and wonder. You're not going to tell me that a rifle-toting bear actually did kill him, are you? Well, yes and no. Listen to this. About a year later, a detective at the Montana State Division of Criminal Investigation up in Helena answered a telephone call. It was a police officer from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. He was inquiring whether DCI was aware of any unsolved homicides in Granite County. He said he had a man sitting in his police station in Pawtucket who had confessed in writing 
to having shot and killed a man a year earlier at a campsite in the vicinity of Rock Creek. You're kidding me. I'm not. As it turns out, the detective who took the call at DCI just happened to be a former officer for the Missoula Police Department. He was not only familiar with the case, but had been personally involved in putting the wanted poster together. He hung up and called Granite County. By that time, the former sheriff had been replaced, and when the DCI detective made the new sheriff aware of the phone call, a decision was made that Granite County would go to Rhode Island and bring the man back to Montana, which is what happened. He stood trial, was convicted, and went to prison. Huh. So it wasn't a bear after all. <laughs> well, in a manner of speaking, the man actually was killed by a bear. In a manner of speaking? What are you talking about? You just finished telling me that a guy confessed to shooting the victim and went to prison. That's true. But you're never going to guess what the defendant's name was. I give up. His name was Norman A. Bear, which is pronounced in the Cajun fashion, A. Bear. Honestly, you can't make this kind of stuff up. Isn't that a great story? I mean, A. Bear. I totally stumbled on that. The a detective who took the phone call is a friend of mine, and he said, oh, you're going to be a grand candidate. i got to tell you this great story. He told me the story, and, you know, that was fun and funny. He, even he didn't know the ending of it. So I went to Granite County and I started rummaging around in the files and lo and behold, there it is, a bear. And so maybe the sheriff wasn't as stupid as we thought he was. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's my friend Hector who mocked up the photographs that are in the book, including the, what I think is a wonderful cover. Um, he runs Hector Spiner at Gallery in Hardin, Montana. All right, this is kind of a preview of coming attractions, which is the last two minutes of the show here. Red Corner, Red Corner, get that idea in your head. This is, this is another amazing discovery. Some of you probably know this. Red Corner, is it a traffic speed trap outside Roundup, Montana in the 90s? Sounds realistic. It's Pete Rose playing third base for the Cincinnati Reds in the 1970s. Well, yeah, that is the Red Corner. How about Lenin's Tomb in Moscow? Yeah, that's pretty red. That'd be a corner there somewhere. How about Sheridan County, Montana in the 1920s? Yep. And that's the answer. Believe it or not, the American Communist, the Communist Party was very active in the latter teens and throughout the bulk of the 20s in the wake of World War II and the Depression and the horrible economic conditions that hit that, that prairie land up there in northeast uh, Montana. And uh, uh, Elaine um, Stoney McDonald, who's from there, wrote a great book. I've never met her. But I stumbled across your book. It's called The Red Corner, and it's straight history right out of the, right out of the conflict that was going on up there between the newspaper guy who was sort of a Citizen Kane type of, uh, type of entrepreneur who wound up occupying the, or, or monopolizing the press up there for a while and, and trying, to, uh, trying to bring communism into uh, what we might call philosophically benevolent communism into the society that was operating up there in a way to try to fight off some of this economic depression and, and tragedy that was going on. And of course, as always happens when people get involved, their other ambitions and motives began to develop. At one point in time, however, Sheridan County had representatives in the state legislature that were registered communists. So that's coming in the next book because I spent some time in Sheridan County this past summer learning about their courtroom and their courthouse. So the journey will continue. There's a little preview of courting justice, not courting truth, courting justice, uh, coming up in more stories and more tales. And that's uh, not the final cover, but that's just sort of a beginning there. Uh, there are the courthouses that will be covered. You may recognize one from your own hometown. Uh, spread again across Montana uh, from uh, Boulder to uh, Fort Benton up to Sheridan and Powder River and uh, Blaine County and uh, down in Beaverhead. Uh, some great, 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 beautiful buildings and great people and great stories. And unfortunately, I ran out of time, so I couldn't tell you all the great stuff that One-Eyed Molly told me about the courthouse in Daniels County, which I call the House of the Rising Sun, which was a bordello. 
Uh, most people that have studied Montana history are aware of that. And there it is. It's still there. Doesn't have those signs on it anymore. And Molly's long gone. But uh, the building was converted. It started out as a hotel and transitioned into being a house of repute, ill or otherwise, and uh, transitioned on into being uh, from the time uh, Dan uh, Daniels County became a county until this very day it is the courthouse. So there's the book, and there's my website. And thank you so much for giving me a chance to come and just tell you a little bit about it.